Amen. You have hope. You've been chosen by God the Father, sanctified by God the Spirit, redeemed by God the Son, and you are a holy nation, and you your people a royal priesthood. And I think we forget what that is. Come on. A royal priesthood means now that what God did, and, and you read the Bible, and he reached down and took the veil of that temple, and he ripped it from the top to the bottom, and he says, now you can walk into my presence, and now you can say, Father, here I am. I have a need. Here I am. I have financial problems. Here I am. I have health problems. And here I am. I have children problems. Here I am. I have job problems. Here I am. I have this. And you can go before the Almighty God. Now he gives us some more reasons. Now when I was a kid growing up, my father did not explain very much in life. I'd say, how come? He said, God, I said so. <laughs> okay, Pop. That's the way it is. Well, how come Johnny down the street? Johnny's not my son. You are. That's all he explained. <coughs> when I was about 14 or 15, I think it's 15, but somewhere close. It's been a lot of years since that water ran across the dam. I got angry at my father. We lived in the inner city of Detroit. It was cold. It was late November, early December. It was snowing. And I got angry. And I said, I'm leaving. And I stormed out of the house. I walked around the block at about 20 degrees. With snow, with our coat, and I come back and I touch the doorknob and it's locked. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I knock on the door and my father opened the door and said, I thought you left. <laughs> I said, I did. He said, Well, what are you doing back here? I said, I changed my mind. He said, There ain't nothing changed inside here. <laughs> You need to understand before you walk through this door. Everything is still the same. So the thing is, we need some reasons for it. We want reasons. Why? And my dad didn't explain a lot of things. He just had his thing. But see, God's not, not sometimes bad as even the earthly fathers. Yeah. I used to tell Penny when she did my children's ministry, I was a great, a great benefit I had as pastor. Every now and then she said, you should save me. Well, I don't play the piano. And I, don't know. I said, honey, you ran my teen ministry. You ran my children's ministry. You are worth more value than God will take care of something else because you're doing a great thing with him. So now he says, the reason for your hope is verse number three. He says, blessed be the God and Father our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy. See, the reason that we have this hope is God is abundantly merciful unto us. Yes, he is. <clears throat> Every now and then I see somebody. I, I, I was in a restaurant the other day. And while I was there, this, just drinking my coffee, this other guy comes in and he's got a satchel with him. And he got cubes running to his nose. And I said, thank you, God, yeah. Yeah. for your mercy. Yes. Yes. Now that doesn't mean I don't know, I didn't know anything about this guy. I don't know his name. I don't know whether it's a Christian or not a Christian. I just looked across the restaurant. And let me tell you, just because he's got the oxygen and I don't, doesn't mean I'm better than him. No. It doesn't mean that, that God's not, not in his heart. It doesn't right. mean he's not saved. That's it right. just means that I want to be thankful to God. Amen. See, I'm not just thankful to God that he's sick and I'm not. I'm just thankful to God that God's merciful to me. And here, I'm thankful that God revealed my price. I'm thankful that God chose me. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit separated me and sanctified me. I'm thankful that Jesus Christ died and paid the price for me and his abundant mercy flowed from heaven unto me. I'm thankful for that. And so he says, his abundant mercy. The next thing he says, you've been begotten, you know, yeah. his abundant mercy has begotten us. Yeah. His mercy begotten me. I'm thankful that when I was back there in that pew, 
that God, divine Holy Spirit, was merciful to me and called me. And I don't know what that meant, what it means, but you, you can take it any way you want to take it. If I still take it, it was free strike, you're out. Bob. Somebody says, have you ever considered going back? I said, never. Never considered going back. Amen. Never considered quitting. You know why? Somebody says, oh, I no, I've always thought it was free strike out. If I go back, I can't get track four. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to the plate again. Yeah. Does that mean it won't be? That doesn't, doesn't mean it to you, but it means it to me. And let me tell you, when you're a preacher, sometimes, and I, I want to tell you, these men that are sitting there, sometimes you, you step in that pool bit and you figure, I can just, just quit. Uh-huh. Now, I know this brother lost has a couple fingers missing. I don't know how he lost his, but I know how I lost. My church member cut it off. Got to watch out for church members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now, he didn't do it on purpose. It was an accident. But on purpose, it's still the same result. It's gone. <laughs> Whatever preacher every now and then gets a little discouraged. He gets a little party. And I've said this many times. The people that cause the least problem in church, they do the most work and they give the most money. Wow. The people that, that give the least and do the least demand the most. You ever notice that? Wow. Well, it sort of sounds like our society, doesn't it? <laughs> Some guy the other day, where I'm helping a guy with his business, the boss guy came along, he's talking to some guy, and he quotes this guy a scripture verse. I said, I don't like that verse. I like this one about if you don't work, you don't eat. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh oh. And he looked at me and said, That's sort of hard, isn't it? I said, No. I just quote the Bible. You're going to quote Bible, we'll quote Bible. Yeah. And so he says, His abundant mercy has begotten us. We are born again. And then he comes back down a little farther in these verses, and he says, It has begotten us again into a liar. Liar. Come on. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some people just believe them. Now, Sister Henderson has tried to get me to slow down for the last 15 years. Yeah. Hadn't been too successful in the last 15 years. One day I'm in Alabama. It's 95 degrees and sunshine. I'm out in the yard working. My shirt is wringing wet. I'm sweating. And she says, you're going to die out there in that yard. I says, you're exactly right. There, God is not going to call me home sitting behind a TV set and doing some of that kind of thing. I'll be working in something, whether it's working in my yard or preaching in a pulpit. Now, one thing was a young girl going to the Church of God, and they called Bendike in those days. And they had a little basement church and all this kind of things. And all of a sudden, the, the pastor had a heart attack and died during his sermon behind the pulpit. Now, don't get nervous if that happens to me, folks, because I'd love that be the way to go. I'd rather go preaching than anything I know of. I'd rather go teaching than any way I know of. Now, it won't be a good thing for you guys, but I won't worry about it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, he's born us unto a livelihood. Now, I, I, don't, I don't look at all the Greek words where I could look at them. And, I, and then sometimes I see these guys, they get up and they explain the Hebrew and the Greek and all this kind of stuff. But livelihood means is more than life. Amen. See, a lot of people are living, they're alive. Mm -hmm. But they're not having life. <laughs> and I read in the Bible where it says, I have come to you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so he's telling me, and you know what that says to me? And if it doesn't mean that, don't tell me because I don't want to know. It says I should enjoy life better than an unbeliever. I should enjoy life better than a sinner. I should enjoy life better than people that's halfway in between them. That I should be enjoying life. And let me tell you, my God says you can have life and you can have an enjoyable life. Yeah. Talk to anybody in here that's been around a few years and still married. Yeah. And ask them what were the best years of their lives. And 99% of them will tell you those years when they were young and they had nothing and they were struggling together. They were struggling to feed the kids. They were struggling to put a house. They were struggling. They were struggling together and they grew together. Oh. Most enjoyable time. 
How many of you thought when you were in high school, high school was the worst four years of your life? Yeah. Most of us left in three weeks. <laughs> but I want to tell you, it was a great time. Come on, come on. And so it's supposed to be a lively, it's supposed to be an enjoyable life. And I've met so many Christians that they don't enjoy life. See, I enjoy hearing preaching. I enjoy yes. Brother, brother yes. I really do. I yes. enjoy him tremendously. I just enjoy sitting there, letting somebody tell me what the Word says. I, I go to church now on a regular basis. Why? I enjoy sitting yes. there in a pew, listening to somebody yes. tell me again what the Word of God says. It doesn't matter. He may say, it's like to tell me the old, old story. And what I've discovered is those that hear, hear it the most love to enjoy it again. I want to tell you, when you start talking about salvation, when you start talking about being born again, when you start talking about being healed, and you start talking about the mercies of God, something jumps up inside of me. And somebody tells you about being born again, and somebody tells you about being filled, and somebody tells you about God, and something doesn't bubble up. You need to be in an altar. So lastly, in closing, the last thing he says to them, you need to also understand there's a reward. Yeah. You know, nice to know there's a reward. Amen. Now I heard one of the great preachers of the Church of God say this a number of years ago, a lot of years ago, said if, if there wasn't no heaven, I wouldn't preach. Good thought. I preach because I know. I'm redeemed. What I know, I know I'm on my way to heaven. What I, know I know there's a God. I know that one day I will be with Him. I know. And so it doesn't matter what happens to me while I'm here in this world because I know I'm headed to a better place. See, it doesn't matter to me. I know that if I die, I'm going to be in heaven. If I live, it is going to be gain. If I live, I'm going to go into rapture. Come on. I believe that. Yes. And so he says, first of all, in verse number four, he says, you have an inheritance. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I never inherited anything <laughs> in my life. No, it's always keeping from somebody else. <laughs> you know? Come on. When my mother passed away, she had no insurance. Everything that she owned, you could put in one box and carry out of my sister's house. And she was in Kansas. My dad was buried in North Carolina. And I'd give my mother my, her word. I'd take her back to North Carolina and bury her alongside of daddy. Come on. Yeah. And I said to Penny, I'm going to take equity out of the house. I'm not going through life, the rest of my life, that I didn't keep the word to my mother. So I took $10,000 out of my house. And I did a funeral in Kansas because my sister and a lot of friends were there. Then I had her transported on a plane and drove all the way to North Carolina myself, and there had a funeral director take care of that, and take care of the funeral there and everything else, and, and you know, my sister couldn't afford anything, my brother couldn't afford anything, and I said, it doesn't matter to me. Mother is going back to North Carolina. Mother is going back to South Long Side of Daddy, because I told her what, see, because of the thing you'll understand, I've never had an inheritance, but one of these days, I have an inheritance. See, but my inheritance is not in a bank, not in somebody else's bank. See, a lot of people are waiting, like the rich young ruler there with everything, and the prodigal son, him wanting all of his, and taking it out and spending it. Let me tell you, my inheritance, see, a lot of reason a lot of people are having trouble in retirement, is they wasted everything when they were young and now they have nothing to live on when they're old and they're blaming it on somebody else. Yes. Oh. Amen. Amen. Well, let me tell you, you may take all my money. It doesn't matter to me if the economy goes down except in this life. And I don't have any more years of that. But I have an inheritance, you know. I have an inheritance from God. I've been sending that building material to build my mansion. Hallelujah. Well, this is true or not. An old preacher a number of years ago I was listening to said the reason some people are going to get to heaven, you ever reason, hear that little song, Be Me a Cabin in the Corner of Glory? They've only, they've only sent enough up to build a little cabin in the Corner yeah. of Glory. Well, let me tell you, I've been sending material up for the last 40 something years, 50 years of my life, and by now, I think I've got, got enough material up there to build me a mansion. Yeah. Now, somebody said it doesn't 
doesn't mean mansion in, in John when John's talking about it means in many rooms. Well, if you want a room in a hotel, you get one. Yeah. God's going to be a in my house. You know, Paul, I've been preaching this word, and let me say it, God is building me a mansion. And one day you get my mansion completed, and one day my mansion completed, he will say, Lord, come up hither, and I will go there and take my inheritance. If you want a cabin in the corner of glory, you take one. If you want a room in Motel 6, you take one. God building me a mansion. Oh, and I love this one. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Houses have been going down. A million dollar houses are worth 500,000. Yeah. 100,000 dollar houses are worth 50,000. And, and on down the line you could go. And banks are going bankrupt. The federal government is broke. Yeah. The state government is broke. Yeah. The city government is broke. Most of the companies are broke. It seems like everybody's broke. But let me tell you, I'm not worried about it. Why? Because mine is not in a bank. It says in verse number four, mine is reserved yes. in heaven. Amen. I've been putting mine in the bank of heaven. Oh, I've been oh, putting mine up in the treasure in the bank of heaven. And I have an inheritance coming yes. because I am putting it away. And lastly, he says, not only that, it's being kept by the power of God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I like that security system. Thank you. Security system. I like that. <laughs> yeah? I like that. I sent it to the bank of heaven. I lost. So I have my repairs there, and the one that's in charge of my account Hallelujah. is God himself. Oh, yeah. Yes. You hear on the news, the guy who used to be governor of New Jersey and was a senator. When he left, after they voted him out in New Jersey, he went to be the CEO of a great big financial fund. Yeah. And now the thing has bellied up. And there's a billion. A billion is more than your mind can grasp in my mind. That's right. A billion, two hundred million, and it's just missing. Yeah. How can you misplace a billion dollars? I know it if I lose a dollar or so most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I positively know if I lose a thousand. Oh. Yeah. I know that the bank makes a mistake in my account any month. Oh, Lord. How can you lose a billion, two hundred million dollars and you say, I don't know where it went. I'm glad he's not in charge of my account. <laughs> I'm glad that Obama's not in charge of my account. I'm glad that no politician and no senator is in charge of my account. But my account, my inheritance is in heaven. It's reserved in the bank of God. God is the king of my inheritance. And one of these days, I'll split the east with him and let me pay it there forever to live with the Lord because he has blessed me. So Peter says, you need to have some hope. Yeah. And I've come today to tell you, don't let this newscast drag you down. Pretty good. Come on. Don't let the call for this take place. Pretty good. Come on. I looked at a new book out on the market called The Resurrection of the Auto. Uh-huh. Crazy title. Yes. <laughs> the government has not resurrected General Motors and crackers. No. All they have done is resuscitated for a period of time. Yeah. I hate to give you the bad news, but in my opinion, they are still going to die. It's so incredible. That's right. The federal government has been pumping money, yep. printing down in the basement, Amen. like this. And one of these days, the printing press will stop, and the government will go bankrupt. Yeah. yeah. And everything will go, but God said, my son, don't let your eyes be on the stock market. Don't let your eyes be on the government. Don't let your eyes be on the job. Don't even let your eyes be on the church, because the church will fail you. Keep your eyes on me and understand I have called you. I have chosen you. Now I will bless you, and I will keep your inheritance. It will be intact when you get here. Stand with me if you will. Hallelujah.